walked in. He got scared. He ran out. And I said, I said, what's wrong? He said, that Buddha on the main altar. Well, you know, it wasn't a Tibetan Buddha. It was an American Buddha on the altar. And uh, you can imagine what kind of American Buddha, right? So it was African American Buddha. And so I was like, what was I going to do? It was just like you. And so, uh, you know, what I really like is the notion that that uh, all of this is cultural baggage because I really don't think that it's cultural baggage. I think that all of these things are important, but we can change the imagery. We can, you know, change the ways that we talk about things. So what I'm leaving behind is the notion that this is only Tibetan, or that's only Chinese, or that's only for Sri Lanka, and this is for Americans. And so just dropping that off and bringing all the different uh, aspects onto the path is what I'm taking up, and that's what I'm dropping off. Who talk a lot about translation, so let me phrase the question. What about the Chinese Mahayana that you were trained in does not translate currently to Silicon Valley in the 21st century? I think a lot of the, the ritual aspects, a lot of people turn to Buddhism because they didn't like the, the rituals in Western religion. Um, so they are kind of against it, thinking that Zen Buddhism or Chan has none of that. But actually, we do. We have a lot of those. And I was against that too, actually, when it came to Buddhism, until my master told me, explained the meaning behind the chanting, the meaning behind the praise, the meaning behind the, the ritual. So I think when we have the ritual without understanding the meaning and how it helps you practice, then that's kind of pointless. Uh, but when you do understand, it can be another way, a skillful means to, to help people practice together. Uh, you've probably seen images of these in Chinese monastery, monastery in China, so people who burn a huge batch of incense, so just making a lot of pollution. Uh, that could probably be left behind. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, there are certain cultural, very Chinese cultural aspects. I don't think I need to go into details because it doesn't really relate to, to people here. Um, but I think it's also important to find American culture or Western culture uh, that can integrate well with, with uh, Buddhist practices. So, you know, if I were going to ask you the question, you're thoroughly steeped in the tradition of yogis and mantras and healing, but you live in the West. So, what, when you're trying to explain to Westerners, what doesn't communicate that you would like to change, perhaps? My experience of living in the West is still pretty short, only about five years in Europe and traveling around the world. Um, what I see is that um, people do not have enough trust in themselves. They don't feel comfortable with themselves. And, and even if you tell them that they're so good, they're just perfectly imperfect. Because um, <laughs> we're all imperfect in, in a sense, but we're perfectly imperfect. And uh, I think people with a lot of love around them try to tell that and try to let them understand, but they cannot, like people, a lot of people in the West, I see that they cannot accept who they are internally. And they try to, um, they try to all be good. And I think that's kind of really tiring. Um, um, being, being a bad person sometimes um, can take more sacrifices and uh, can, can actually bring a lot of goodness. But I mean bad in a sense, in a special way of bad. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, that, that's hard to communicate with um, people in the West. Since, since you got the microphone, could I ask you to say just a word about your work uh, with introducing uh, the West to filiality and the sense of connection to parents, particularly to the mother and, and women? That's, I know she has a YouTube video that speaks to that and very moving. Maybe just, just give us a, a little bit of how important that is. Mm -hmm. so, um 
we believe that in the system of reincarnation, we have once been each other's mothers. So if we do remember the kind of unconditional love we receive from our mothers, then that would really just melt all the ice in between. And um, I understand that a lot of discursive thoughts have penetrated into um, our modern culture, not only in the West nowadays. I see that in the East, um, where Xiao Dao is, where, where information is so strongly rooted, is also being questioned. A lot of Asian families are having um, problems um, in terms of the relationship between parents and children. But then in the West, it's really absent. There, there is, um, um, there is really um, not enough understanding of love in between kids and uh, parents. So um, in most of my talks, I'm emphasizing on uh, the the impermanent life or the precious human life that is being given to us by our parents, and that's the most important and the the beginning of our life and anything we enjoy in our life we should give thanks to our parents because they gave us this unconditional blissful life. I, I really get the sense that the confidence that you display and, and the strength and power of taking a Tibetan Buddhist tradition to the West that energy comes from your connection to that Hindu tradition. And that's, that's a, a lesson for us in the West. Thank you. So, there we have it. I think one of the messages that I would like to point out, if, if it hasn't occurred to all of you, is the, the collegiality and friendship on the stage. Uh, men and women, East and West, young and old, I'm going to be 70. She's already 70. Uh, bringing... You want to rebut that? That's all right. We're bringing the Dharma to the West together. And this is the next generation, and I've seen a lot of young faces here. There's another generation coming. And this partnership, this collegiality and collaboration, uh, demonstrates how past ignorance can be transformed. In the Buddha's own lifetime, 17 competing schools developed uh, to compete with each other about what was the, the right material for alms bowls, right? That sort of thing. That kind of sectarian They didn't kill each other, though. What's that? They didn't kill each other. They didn't kill each other, that's true. We have a something in the 21st century is brand new, that's right. But factions and tribes among religions is an obsolete, narrow perspective. It's a wrong view, you could say, xie jian in Chinese, it's a wrong perspective. After Earthrise, that famous photograph, the view from the Mariner spacecraft of our small blue marble of Earth, clouded, full of water, in this inky vastness of space, we can recognize the Buddha Dharma now as a means, one means of transcending tribal sectarian views, showing us how to be post-tribal living beings and companions on spaceship Earth. So here we are in our Global Buddhist Conference, and let's keep that vision. I'm delighted that we were able to begin this way. Notice that we didn't invite any questions from the audience, and that's because of the, uh, the number, the quality of the speakers that we have in this conference. We decided to hold the Q&A, if you want to write down your questions now. Uh, we have a meet and greet and Q&A at 1.20 in Lower Sprawl, uh, in the circle tent, I think you find that in the center, a chance to talk to all of our panelists today. So that's 1.20 to 1.50. So that's how we're going to do our Q&A from all of you. So come and say hello. Find out more about Venerable Dr. Panyuati and her new center with 90 rooms for practitioners to come and 
in uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina, in the Blue Ridge Mountains, a beautiful part of the United States. Come to Silicon Valley to uh, practice Zazen, uh, the Chinese tradition, at the Sunnyvale Zen Center. And also tune in to uh, Kukmo Yao Akini's uh, music on YouTube and where else do we find you? <coughs> Website, Facebook, everywhere. She's everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>